The goal of this screencast is to give you a good intuitive understanding of asymptotic efficiency and the standard notation used to express it, uh, which is big O, big omega, and big theta. So just a quick review here. Um, typically, we measure time efficiency in terms of the number of instructions as a function of the problem size. Using either what's called the random access machine model or what I'll talk about here is some basic operation like comparison and how many times that's done. Usually the basic operation approach um, is a handy one. It's a little easier to use in most cases and it captures the essence of what you're trying to get at, which namely is how long is the algorithm going to take uh, on large size problems. So what do I mean by problem size? Just again, a quick review. It's the amount of memory necessary to store the problem's basic definition or data that defines it. And basically what we're looking for is some metric that's independent of the hardware and software. So we don't want to get tied down to any particular machine or compiler. Um, and again, the basic operation approach, which is what I'm going to focus on, is count some specific type of instruction, say for sorting, comparison, or for some mathematically complex thing, it might be something like multiplication. And when we're doing this, we're gonna we may need to worry about different cases: worst case, best case, or average case. Um, and so, just to remind you, if you've been seeing the other screencasts, you've seen this already. Uh, if we count the instructions. Uh, for the worst case, that's going to be the maximum uh, number of instructions for inputs of size n. Uh, best case will be the minimum for over all the inputs of size n, and average would be some average. Um, the uh, average case is typically more diff much more difficult to compute than the worst case or the best case. To a large degree, people focus on the worst case performance because in most applications, that's what you're concerned with, how long do you have to wait um, what's the largest number, amount of time that you're going to have to wait until the algorithm completes. So again, we're looking for a metric for large problems because that's when it's, it's likely that the algorithm is going to take a large, long time to complete. And so we pay little attention to the factors that are less important in terms of its the length of time for a large problem, uh, namely different types of instructions, constant factors, and lower order terms. So typically, if the number of instructions is a polynomial, all we're going to care about is the degree of the polynomial. Asymptotic efficiency, which is what we're talking about here, what we care about is for large input sizes. Um, and generally, we're looking for worst case guarantees. So on this slide, just to give you some idea about why uh, we just really can focus in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, just on the order of growth. Uh, here's some typical orders of growth. Uh, log n, so the number of instructions is some constant times log of n, plus other small, smaller terms, or some constant times n, n log n, lots of sort routines are n log n, n squared, 2 to the n, and n factorial. And you can see what happens that for... Uh, log of n, it's incredibly fast, even up to a million things. I mean, remember that the log base 2 of a million is just 20. So it's a small, that's a very going to happen very quickly. Um, for n, um, now you're getting up into the milliseconds instead of microseconds. So this is a few hundred times longer. Uh, n log n, notice, this, here's the 20 I was talking about. Uh, log base 2 of a million is, is 2, is 20, sorry. So you get 20 uh, uh, milliseconds. And then n squared. Notice, finally, in about a million here, these are going up by a factor of 10 each time. Now it's starting to really make a difference. I mean, it, once this is, you'll you'd notice an algorithm that took 17 minutes, roughly 17 minutes. Still not outrageous, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then, but once you get up to exponential time, uh, then things really fall apart. This is only for 100. Exponential time is 10 to the 13th years. 
Um, so clearly, you don't want an algorithm if you can avoid it that's exponential. And factorial is even worse. These empty spaces are numbers that are much bigger than the uh, age of the universe. So the next thing on our agenda is to talk a little bit about big O, big omega, and big theta. So as you probably know from other places, big O basically is, you can think of it as sort of an upper bound on some function, okay? And the way we define it rigorously, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, is basically past some point of input size. So input size is bigger than N0. We can find a constant, right, so that C times G of N, for big O of G of N, is bigger than the number of instructions. So big O of N is like an upper bound for the function past a certain point, which we usually denote by N sub 0. Big omega is basically a lower bound past some per certain point, again, N sub 0. Um, and and that, that can be, that number can certainly vary depending on the algorithm. Um, and so then C times G of N is below the number of instructions. So both of these are sort of bounds. You can think of T of N over here for big O of N could be way down here. It'd still be big O of N. It could be constant, big O of N, uh, big O of G of N. So it doesn't, it, it tells you an up, sort of an upper bound, but it doesn't tell you how low, how fast, much faster it may be. If you want to know both an upper bound and a lower bound, that's big theta of g of n. So now the instructions, the number of instructions that have to get executed past a certain uh, problem size is going to be bounded above by some c times g of n and bounded below by some different c, c2 of g of n. This slide has the formal definitions. I won't bore you by reading it uh, to you, but you should definitely study it. So T of n is big O of f of n if there exists these two constants. This is remember this is the multiplier of f of n, and n zero is the point past where you're going to be the number of instructions are going to be bounded. So n zero bigger than zero, so that T of n is less than c times f of n. So it's bounded by c times f of n when n is bigger than n zero. Notice this definition for omega is exactly the same, except all you need to do is change this inequality. So for big O, T of n was less than or equal to. For big omega, it's bigger than or equal to. So again, omega is, you can think of it as a lower bound. And then theta is a tight bound on both upper and lower. Okay, so now you need two constants, and again, the point past which uh, you've got a big enough problem that you care about it, and T of n is captured between C1 of f of n and C2 of f of n. There are other classes, little o and big o and little omega, that basically uh, are analogous to uh, less than, as opposed to less than or equal to. So big O of f of n are, is basically the set of functions that grow more, grow more slowly than f of n. And good old omega of f of n are functions that grow strictly faster than f of n. Here's our pictures again. I won't spend any time on them, um, but it's good to take these pictures and reference them back to the formal definitions of given on the last slide. Here are just some of the properties um, that um, are... I think pretty intuitive, but important to remember. F of n is a function in big O of f of n, right? I mean, f of n obviously grows at the same rate as f of n. It's bounded above by f, some constant times f of n, say 1.1. If f of n is big O of g of n, then g of n is in big omega of f of n. Okay, so if I sort of read this intuitively, if f of n doesn't grow any faster than g of n, then g of n doesn't grow any slower than f of n. This is a more interesting one, an important one, which we'll use all the time without ever stating it, that f of n is in big O of g of n, and g of n is in big O of h of n, then f of n is in big O of h of n. So you could think of this as if 
uh, 10 times n is in big O of n squared, and n squared is in big O of n cubed, then 10 times n is in big O of n cubed. So, so intuitively, I think that's pretty obvious, and the proof actually is, is very straightforward. Similarly, um, intuitively, I think, but maybe a little less intuitively than the previous one, if f1 is in big O of g of 1 and f2 is in big O of, f o of, o of g of 2 of n, then the sum is in big O of the max of those two functions. If you think about it, that makes sense. If, if one of these functions, uh, say if f of 1 is in O of n squared and f of 2 is in O of n cubed, right, then the sum, summation, is going to be in big O of n cubed. A few facts that we'll use over and over again, um, or you'll use over and over again in analyzing your algorithms, is uh, all logarithmic functions belong to the same class, no matter what the logarithm space is. That's because log base 2 and log base 10 are just, they're only different by a constant. Um, and we'll explore that in some of the labs. Um, polynomials, um, all we care about, of course, is the highest degree term, so the degree of the polynomial. Uh, exponential numbers do have different orders of growth, though. So 3 to the n grows faster than 2 to the n. So these, just because exponential and logarithms are inversely, are inverse functions of each other, that doesn't mean that they behave the same in terms of asymptotic growth. So you have to re remember this one. It's important that exponential functions grow faster um, if they have a larger base. And then here's the ordering. Um, so if a function's order log n, right, that's going to be less than the ordering of n to some alpha where alpha is bigger than zero. So for instance, log of n grows slower, strictly slower actually. This is an abusive notation, but what I mean by this is uh, it, it grows strictly slower um, than say n to the square root of n or the cube root of n or n squared, cube, the cube root of n squared, which would be n to the two thirds. And that's an obvious, so the bigger alpha is, the bigger the order of growth. Um, so this could be, so n to the squared, n squared is less than n cubed, etc. Then we've got exponential functions, okay? And they're all faster than, uh, grow more fast, grow faster than polynomials. Uh, and factorial functions grow faster even than the exponentials. And then finally, if I have n to the n, that grows faster even than factorial. At this point, I'm not going to spend time proving any of the properties, but generally speaking, the properties are all pretty much straight, direct proofs straight from the definitions. Um, so for t of n being to, in big O of g of n, for instance, you just you play around with whatever the uh, expressions are, and try to figure out a good way what c has to be to be to multiply g to dominate all the terms over in t of n. And at the same time, ensure that you find the n, n sub naught, the n, n zero, that um, where the c will work. On the other hand, to show that t of n is not in big O of g of n, then you use an indirect proof, usually a proof by contradiction, showing that given some c greater than 0 and n 0, any fix, those, fi those numbers being fixed, they could be anything, but you show that there's some n that will violate the inequality. Again, we'll do a few of these in class during the course of the term, uh, but right now I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Finally, this slide's worth looking at a little bit um, for you. Make sure that you sort of understand good examples for each one of these. So if the order of growth is logarithmic. Binary search is a good example of that. Think about what happens with binary search. Each time you iterate through the loop or a recursive call, what do you do? You're cutting the size of the problem in half. Hence, you get log of n. Um, for linear, say merging two lists in merge sort or just a linear search, um, it takes, uh, you basically have to, in a linear search, you have to make roughly 
n minus or n comparisons in the worst case, and so you get a big O of n, big theta of n. Log linear uh, merge sort's a good example of that, um, and we'll there was a separate uh, screencast on uh, showing that merge sort is n log n. Um, if you're counting pairs of numbers, for instance. In other words, ordered pairs like in the uh, Cartesian coordinates uh, and they're integers, then it's going to be n squared, um, triples, n cubed. Computing all the subsets of a set is going to look like an exponential, 2 to the n, and computing the set of all the permutations uh, is going to look like n factorial. So these are some important examples. Hopefully you've seen most of these, and so you can relate to these different levels different orders of growth. Hope you found this helpful.